this is the first in our series on ingenious inventions, and we have a great Science on Saturday series for you for the next couple of weeks, and the first one is all about forensics. And so I'd like to take this time to introduce our team. First we have Catherine Wang, who is a teacher at Darty Valley High School in San Ramon. And she has been working with our team of laboratory scientists the director of the forensic scientist, chemist Brad Hart, his colleague, chemist Dean Annix, and biochemist Caitlin Mason. So without further ado, let's find out what they are going to talk to us today about forensics. Thank you. All right, good morning. Hey, thank you all for coming. It's great, great to, to see you all, and we're excited to talk to you about what we've been working on for uh, for forensics. So as you can tell from the title, um, we're saying that forensic science is in crisis. So what I'm going to do throughout the course of this talk with my, with my team here is we're going to tell you about um, what the issues are with forensics and how we're trying to address some of those using uh, the science of proteins. So as we go through this, we'll go through a couple of, uh, we're going to ask a couple of questions, if I can get the slides to move. Okay. Maybe if I do that. Ah, OK. A couple of questions um, about forensics. So the first question really is, what is forensics? What do we even mean when we say that? And specifically, what is forensic science? And what do scientists have to do with this, uh, this whole process? Um, as we do that, we'll talk a little bit more about evidence and the different kinds of evidence that you have. And they sort of bend themselves into different kinds of groups, OK? And we'll talk specifically about that. And if we have forensic science already and we're doing this, then why do we need research into it? And what, what value comes from the research that we're doing? And what specifically are we doing at Lawrence Livermore to try to improve forensics? And as I alluded to in the title, I'll give you a hint, it has to do all about proteins. And we're very excited about this work. So what is forensics? So if you look up forensic science in Wikipedia, you'll get something like this. It says this is the application of science to civil or criminal laws, okay? And so what you oftentimes think about is like CSI, you know, the TV shows where their scientist goes and they capture evidence from a crime scene and they take it back to a lab and over the course of about 20 minutes they, they analyze it and put it in some fancy instruments and come up with an answer that tells them whether the person that they suspect is either innocent or guilty, okay? And Honestly, that's pretty much how it is. It is pretty much that. If the timelines are a little bit designed for TV, but really that's what it is. There's a process for forensics that kind of follows that pattern. And so the first step is evidence collection. And if you think about this, this is, okay, I have a fingerprint or I have a knife at a crime scene. I need to collect that and get it back to the laboratory. And so how I do that is really important. So for example, how do I preserve that evidence? How do I make sure that it's not being contaminated or destroyed somehow while I'm processing and transporting that to the laboratory? The third step is the analysis of that evidence. And that's mostly what we're going to talk about today. And this is really where science uh, takes hold and plays a critical role. And this is where we're analyzing the evidence. We're applying analytical instrumentation or trained expertise of a forensic examiner to understand the evidence and what it means about um, the guilt or innocence of a suspect, for example. And finally, and this is probably one of the more important steps, is how do you communicate that information? And this is a challenge for scientists all the time, is how do we communicate scientific information to people that need that information that may not be scientists? So how do we explain evidence and the results to a jury, for example, or to a legal team or to a judge, those sorts of things? So those four steps are really the critical processes um, that encompass the process of forensics. So let's look at some examples of forensics evidence and talk about them a little bit. So the first one is something everyone's probably familiar with, and that's fingerprints, okay? So fingerprints are very common. They've been used for decades and decades for helping to identify specific people. If you look at the picture on the screen, what you see is a fingerprint is really made up of a bunch of ridges, those white areas that you see. And it's thought that everyone on the planet, everyone ever born, has different fingerprints. There's never been found to be what we would call a match between two people. Um, that's, that's not a statistical measure, which is part of the issue, but that's an observation, okay? And so what forensic examiners look at when they look at fingerprints is they look at those ridges, they look at the pores on the fingerprint, and they look at how those ridges may stop or they may split into two peaks, and they, they start to catalog these and basically map those fingerprints out. And then once they have that map, they can use it to compare to another fingerprint or to an individual. 
And so that's the process of fingerprints. And the, the key here is that it's a pattern. You're generating a pattern of features on a fingerprint that then you're using, an expert uses to compare uh, to another fingerprint. Another type of evidence that's very common deals with firearms or, or bullets, okay? So I'm sure you're all aware, they show this on the TV shows all the time, if you fire a bullet from a gun, then the gun itself leaves marks on that bullet. It leaves uh, grooves and lanes where it goes down the barrel and it leaves marks, cartridges get marks from things like firing pins and all of these can in some cases be specific and, and have small details that change depending on the actual gun that was used. And so what a forensic examiner would do is they would take that evidence, either a bullet recovered from a crime scene, for example, or a cartridge casing, and they would compare that to other bullets they've recovered or to a firearm itself and try to determine whether the pattern of features on those bullets or those cartridge casings match what they would expect to come from that gun or match another bullet. And so, again, the key here, this is a pattern. This is an expert who's been trained in this, who's looking at these evidence. They're mapping out these different features and they're comparing them. They're making an, a subjective comparison. One more, and this is really important for what we're talking about today, is hair evidence. So as you might imagine, if you go to a crime scene, you might collect hair. And hair is, all, we shed hair all the time. We lose it um, as we go through our day, some of us more than others. And uh, that hair can be collected from a crime scene. And so oftentimes you'll want to compare hair from a crime scene to hair from a suspect, okay? And the way that forensic examiners do that currently is they look at the two hairs under a microscope and they look at things like the color of the hair, the shape of the hair, is it curly, is it straight? Uh, what are the scales on the outside, the hair shaft look like, like you can see in the picture there? And they make these sort of observations and they look at these patterns and they compare them between hairs and make a subjective determination, are these, does this hair match the suspect's hair, for example? And so, this is really important for what we're talking about today, so I want to do a demonstration. We're going to bring uh, Kathy out from Doherty Valley, and we're going to do a, 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 a hair comparison where you guys are going to help us determine whether we have a match or not. Okay, we're trying to figure out who sat in this seat and ate that donut that's on the, on the chair right there. And I have four suspects. And audience, I would like you to help me figure out if this suspect matches the hair that was collected at the scene. So looking at this specimen right here, um, the one that you're comparing with, the one that was found on the scene was on, is on the left side, is of a dark color. And then the one on the right is the, the suspect. Now if you feel like they match up and this is the person that um, sat here, I want to hear roaring applause. If not, I just want to see a thumb, just thumbs down from the audience. So does this match up? Thumbs down, all right. So you can kind of see that there's not a lot of pigment in this hair. It's very light colored, it's a light um, blonde color, whereas the one on the left is a dark, light, uh, dark black hair. Now let's move on to our next suspect. All right, as we move along. All right, here's another suspect right here. Do these match up? Applause are down, down, all right. So you can see that the hair color is dark. There's pigment in the center called the medulla, but it's not exactly the same as the one collected at the crime scene. Um, let's go on to our third suspect. All right, what about these two? Let me focus it a little bit. Do these match up? Kinda, do we know? No? All right, you guys are a smart group. <laughs> they look, are both pigmented really dark, um, but they are not the same from the same source. The one on the right actually is from a guinea pig, a long-haired, dark guinea pig. <laughs> and if you look at the fourth suspect, let's look at the patterns here. Lots of bubbles, here we go. Do these match up? <laughs> Loud applause. <laughs> All right, so you can see that the pigment, the color, the thickness do match up. You can see that it's pretty subjective in figuring out um, what hair, where hair matches, and the donut was actually very tasty. So thank you, Brad, back to you. <laughs> awesome. You saw there that actually it can be difficult. You guys are a smart group. I'll just tell you right now, the last group had a lot more trouble with that third slide, okay, they thought, with the guinea pig slide. But, but it is really subject to your ability to look at these pieces of evidence and tell whether they're the same or not. And they may be very similar, it might be really hard to do. 
And so this sort of encompasses one of the main issues with forensic science today, and that is a reliance on subjective methodology. And there are a lot of things, similar examples we could give. Shoe prints, for example, and, and tool marks, and bite marks, believe it or not, and tire tread marks. All of these kinds of evidence rely on someone who's been trained, an expert, to compare two examples and determine whether they're the same or not. There's another type of evidence, though, which is not pattern evidence, and we call that analytical evidence. And this is a type of forensic evidence and analysis that actually compares things using chemical or biological instrumentation and makes objective determinations, not subjective determinations, about something, whether something is present or absent or whether two things are the same. Okay, so for example, if you had a white powder and you thought it might be an illicit drug, for example, well, an analytical chemist could use instrumentation such as that shown on the slide and tell you that, no, that's actually just baking soda, that's not an illicit drug that we need to be concerned about. So these are, these are um, not subjective measure, measurements, these are determinations, these are actual analytical measurements. And so let's sh look at a couple of examples of these kinds of evidence. So one has been around for a very long time, and this is blood type. So you can see on the screen, there are basically four kinds of blood, blood types, and it's a very simple test to determine who, what sort of blood type you have. I'm B positive, for example. And uh, you inherit this attribute from your parents, okay? And so um, it's possible to go in and look at a blood sample and determine that type of blood. The problem with this from a forensic standpoint is it's not very discriminating, and there's only a few, a you know, handful of blood types, and so you could say if the blood did not come from someone, if it didn't match their blood type, but if it was, did match their blood type, then you wouldn't be able to say very much about whether it was that specific person or not, just that it was consistent with that person. There's a newer kind, and I say newer, this has been around for, started to come in about 30 years ago, and that's DNA, and this is what we always hear about, right? DNA is, has changed forensics, and it really has, and I'll talk about how that has happened. So we're gonna spend some time on this. This is really important for some of the work we talk about with, later with the proteins. So I wanna get into it just a little bit. So what is DNA, and how do we use it in forensics? So all of our living cells, almost all of our living cells have a nucleus that contains 23 pairs of chromosomes. We inherit these chromosomes from our parents, and these are really the blueprint for who we are. They define everything about us, our physical attributes, uh, what color our hair is, our eyes, we have two arms and two legs, they're really important, okay? And the chromosomes themselves, as you'll see on the screen, are actually made up of extremely long strands, extremely long molecules called DNA. And they're huge molecules, but really they're pretty simple. They're actually only made up of four building blocks, and those are listed on the screen, cytosine, guadenine, adenine, and thymine. And so to make things easy, we just abbreviate those based on their first letter. So C-G-A-T, that's, that's how we'd call them. So DNA, as long as it is, is just a sequence of these four building blocks repeated in different patterns, okay? And those patterns, in some cases, are called genes. They come together, and a gene defines, for example, a specific protein that's being synthesized. And that's gonna be really important for how we do our um, new forensics work later in the talk. Um, and that's what makes us unique. Okay, so as everybody in this room, every human on the planet has the same genes. Uh, but there, there are subtle differences in those genes that defines all the diversity um, in the population. So it's really important, and it's an incredibly powerful forensic tool, DNA. So now I wanna talk about how we use this in forensics. So let's look at uh, the gentleman on the screen there, Mr. Sunglass Guy, okay, and so let's take a look at a stretch of his DNA, and in the yellow boxes I've shown his genes, okay, and as I mentioned, Everybody in the, on the planet's gonna have those same genes. There are gonna be small differences in there, but they're all gonna have fundamentally the same ones. But you see there's all this DNA in between the genes that doesn't, that, that doesn't code for anything. It doesn't produce a product. And for a long time, scientists thought this DNA actually had no purpose, and they actually called it junk DNA. We know now that it actually does have some function. It helps control how genes are expressed and when they turn on and off. But the other thing it does is it provides a very powerful forensic tool because contained within these regions are sections we call short tandem repeats, or STRs for short. And so what, it, what an STR region is, is an area of very small um, segments of DNA. So the two examples I've shown you, in purple we have G-A-T-A, -A, and in green we have T-A. Those are just the, the sequence of those bases I talked about before. And then they're repeated over and over again um, in that section of the DNA. So everyone on the planet has these STR regions, and they all have the same little subsequence, the same uh, short sequence included. 
But what's really important for forensics is the number of times those sections repeat varies hugely among the population. And it allows us to use a mathematical tool, once we go in with our instrumentation and analyze and count the number of times those boxes repeat, it allows us to then do math called, called the product rule to determine what's the probability that we would expect to see that same sequence in some number of people. And so the power of DNA is enormous. Our ability to, to exclude other people is shown on the screen. It's one in a quintillion. Okay, that's one in 10 to the 18th. That's an absurd number. It's so large, it honestly almost means nothing. So to put it in perspective, there are about 7 billion people on the planet. Okay, that's 10 with a 9, 10 to the 9th. Quintillion is 10 to the 18th. It's not only more people than are on the planet, it's more people than have ever been on the planet, than have ever been born. Okay, so it's an enormous number. So that's what makes DNA such a powerful tool. So how do we use it in forensics? So let's say we have Mr. Sunglass Guy, and he's got his STR regions I've shown that repeat 12 times for the, for the purple STR and three times for the green, and we have two other suspects, okay? Gray-haired guy and Mr. Red-haired guy. Okay, and so they have their own, this, their own repeats of the same STR regions, but they repeat a different number of times as shown on the screen. So now let's say we have an unknown DNA sample from a crime scene, and this is our perpetrator. This is the guy who did it. Well, if we analyze that sample and we find that it has nine of the purple STRs and eight of the green ones, which guy was it? Who did the crime? That's right, Mr. Reddit. So that's basically how we do it. Now we have more STR regions. There are about 13 or so that are used routinely um, that help us get to that, that huge number I talked about. But that's the process. It's a process of comparison. But the difference now is that we're using analytical tools and, and real statistics to understand the likelihood that we'll see another match. And that's what separates analytical evidence from pattern evidence. And so if DNA is so great, we have the, I say we have this crisis in, in forensics. And the problem is we still rely very heavily on pattern types of evidence, okay? And so, um, so even though we, have, we don't always have DNA to use, and even when we do, sometimes we're using these pattern types of evidence, and this is a real problem. Um, now we have, DNA has had a huge impact, and I have a couple of examples to show you. So is everyone here, is anyone here familiar with the Innocence Project? See several hands, okay. So the Innocence Project is a group of people who go around and they find people who've been convicted of crimes but where they think they actually may be innocent and that now we have DNA that can help with that case. And they try to use DNA to go back and look at past convictions to determine whether the person was wrongfully convicted or not. And this data is a couple of years old, but it's still pretty powerful. So at the time, they had exonerated over 300 people that had been wrongly convicted using pattern evidence by using DNA. Together, those 300 people had spent over 4,000 years in prison wrongfully. Equally important is in almost half of those cases, they were able to use the new DNA evidence to find the person who actually did the crime. And if they had found the right person at the time, they would have prevented a very large number of violent crimes from being committed. So the use of analytical evidence, and specifically DNA, to help exonerate people or to find the guilty individuals at the start is really, is really important and really impactful. I have one more example of this as well. A couple of years ago, the FBI went back and looked at convictions that had occurred based largely on the comparison of hair samples. So we did our, just like what you guys did, looking under the microscope and comparing hair. And so they looked at a total of 268 convictions that took place. And now what they did is they went back and used a special kind of DNA called mitochondrial DNA to determine whether those pattern type of matches were actually confirmed using DNA, a tool that wasn't available at the time um, of the original conviction. And what they found was shocking. They found that over 95% of those uh, cases were incorrect matches, as determined by the pattern evidence. 257 of the 268 convictions were likely incorrect because the hair evidence was analyzed incorrectly. And in other words, only 11 of the 268 convicted were actually probably guilty of the crime that they were convicted of. It's even more powerful when you consider that about 200, out of those 257 individuals that were convicted, 32 of those were death penalty cases. Those people were given the death penalty in large part due to this pattern-based analysis of, for hair matching and were subsequently determined to be, um, was to subsequently determined to be incorrect. So incredibly important. We really have to think about ways to apply um, cutting edge science to forensic, new forensic methodologies. And so, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, 
And the reason that we're doing research in forensic science is that as great as DNA is, and I've just spent five minutes telling you how awesome it is and how much it's been helping, it's not perfect. Uh, for example, one of the drawbacks to DNA is it's a very unstable molecule. As powerful as it is for helping determine this, the nature of our bodies and giving us life, it's very sensitive. It degrades very quickly in the environment. Or if you have a mixture of DNA, if you have multiple people, for example, if two people leave DNA at a crime scene, it can be difficult or impossible to separate those from each other to do a DNA analysis. So as great as DNA is, there's some real problems. And so what we're, you're going to hear about the rest of the talk today is the science that we've been doing at Livermore to try to come up with new forensic methods that have equal power to DNA for, um, for doing forensic analysis. And so I'm going to invite on the stage my colleague, Caitlin Mason, and she will tell you about some of the science we're doing with proteins. Thank you. As you guys know now, forensic science is in crisis. Fraught with subjectivity and relying only on DNA technology as the only science-based technique, our group is determined to add another science-based tool to the forensic toolbox. We have invented a new way to identify human beings using proteins. This technique is quantifiable and statistics-based, so it's objective. It opens up new avenues for different sample types for forensic evidence. And it addresses the issues that come with DNA um, technology. For instance, it's much more stable of a molecule, and so it is less susceptible to be degraded at crime scenes. And it also doesn't have the issues with mixtures that DNA has because protein samples are often discrete. An example would be if you find a hair at a crime scene, it's clearly from a single individual. So how does this work? As Brad mentioned earlier, your DNA makes you unique. And a reason for this is that DNA tells your cells what proteins to make. The way this works is each set of three nucleic acids, shown in a line in the blue on this slide, are, they have a specific pattern um, called a codon. These patterns determine the amino acid that is in a protein chain. So you can see here that the GTT codon next to the ACC codon tells your cells to make a protein that has a valine amino acid and a threonine amino acid linked together. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So once you have these building blocks connected to one another in a chain, you have a protein. In this example, hemoglobin. The bonds that hold amino acids and proteins together are very stable. They have the tensile strength of a strand of silk and are almost an order of magnitude more stable than DNA. Because of this stability, protein samples can persist in the environment for longer periods of time and are less susceptible to degradation. <clears throat> Hair is an excellent candidate to apply our technology to. Not only is it 90% made of protein, it is also a common evidence that is found at crime scenes. Hair has been shown to persist in the environment in some cases for thousands and thousands of years. And it should also be mentioned, as Brad said before, that the technology used to study hair is very limited. And so it could use an additional technique to gain relevant information from um, forensic hair samples. So how does it work? How can we find information about the identity of a person through their hair proteins? As I mentioned before, we have DNA. It tells your cells how to make proteins in <clears throat> with different codons in the code. But what happens if a human being has a mutation in this genetic code? As you can see here, the C in the DNA strand was mutated to an A. This resulted in a point mutation in the protein, 
where the threonine turned to an asparagine because of the differences in the mutated codon. Sometimes these mutations are very rare. They can be specific for a single individual. And so finding these markers in protein samples, we are able to gather information about the identity of who the hair belongs to. To demonstrate this occurrence in more detail, Kathy's going to come up and lead a demo. Thanks, Caitlin. Let's take the clicker here. Hi, everyone. We are Doherty Valley Biotechnology, and we are here to demonstrate protein synthesis for you. So um, we're going to need your help. I'm going to first teach you how to read a DNA sequence and how to convert it to an amino acid sequence, and then we're going to build this peptide sequence. Okay, so let me show you first how to do it. Um, this is a codon chart, and it converts a DNA sequence into an amino acid. Now, the first thing you do is you look at the very center circle, and notice the, the orange circle. It has the different base pairs, A, C, um, T, and G. So let's say, for example, we start with G. That's our very first base pair. Our second one will fall in the green circle. Let's say it's A. And then the very last one will be in the blue circle. And let's just say it's A again. Now, if you line up those three codons, or those three base pairs, which make up a codon, uh, we have GLU, which stands for uh, glutamic acid. Okay. All right, so we're going to try it out here. Again, these six students are DNA. If you check out our DNA sleeve, we got the cool um, double helix, and they're held together by phosphodiester bonds. If you look at the, at the DNA chart, we have the very first base pair is G, second A, T. Audience, what kind of amino acid is associated? Just yell at the very first um, letter from it. Asparagus. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually aspar aspartic acid. Very good. Let's try the second one, G, T, G. Let's give you a second here. Which one is that? Vaseline. Valine, all right. Valine is the second one. Our third one, G, A, G. Let's try this one here. All right, Glue. good. Glue. This is glutamic acid, like our example. Um, let's keep going. C in the center with the orange, A in the blue, or the green circle, and then A again for blue. What is it? I know, it's kind of hard to, to explain. This is glutamine, GLM, okay? And then our last two, T in the center, G the second level, G the third, what is this? Trip, all right, this is tryptophan, excellent. And our very last one, T in the center, T in the second circle, C in the third, what is that? B, right, so phenylalanine. So now you just helped me build my amino acid sequence. Now sometimes in these sequences, there's a change in the codon sequence, okay, and that can be caused by a mutation. Mutation! Mutations can be scary, but they happen naturally, and that would cause, that's what causes variation. Now, if we have a change in the amino, or sorry, the codon uh, sequence, what happens to the amino acid sequence now? All right, we now have a questionable amino acid, and we now need to figure out what amino acid that is. So um, we're using proteins now because they have really strong bonds, they have peptide bonds. In our next demonstration, we're going to try and figure out what size that amino acid is. Okay. All right, thank you, Doherty. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. So now that we understand how protein mutations can be used to identify human beings, how can we probe the variation in hair proteins at the molecular level? The first thing we have to do is look at the molecular structure of hair. The class of structural proteins called keratins largely make up protein, or hair. <laughs> the keratins are oriented in a strand-like structure and bind to one another using isopeptide and disulfide bonds. These, um, <laughs> these strands of keratin wrap around one another and create a hair filament and a very complex structure. So the way to analyze or probe the variation in these individual proteins is to first break the bonds that make hair so stable. The way we do this is a technique called proteomics. In the first step, we take a hair sample and break it into its individual protein components using biochemical techniques. 
The proteins are too large to analyze at that moment, so we have to break them further into small segments of protein called peptides. The way we do this is through an enzymatic reaction. The result is a complex mixture of peptides, and so we're not able to just look at all peptides at once, so we use liquid chromatography to separate the peptides from one another. Once the peptides are separated in solution, we use a mass spectrometer to measure each individual peptide. Using a combination of bioinformatics and protein databases, we are able to take the data from the mass spectrometer and determine the amino acid sequence for each peptide. So with that said, I will hand over to Dean, and he will explain this process in more detail. Thank you. OK, so Brad and Caitlin set the stage for using proteins in forensics. And knowing that the key to that is knowing a particular amino acid inside that protein. So what we really need is a way to read an amino acid sequence in a protein. And so what I'm going to do right now is take one protein and look at it in some detail, going both through the digestion step and also through the mass spectrometry. And one way to think about this is that we, in order to understand the protein, we kind of need to break it down into smaller parts that we can then measure and understand what, what the details are that we need for, for the forensics. So I'm going to start with uh, keratin 39. This is a, one of the keratins that is in, uh, in hair. Keratin 39 has 491 amino acids, and they're depicted up here with their single letter codes. So each of these letters that you see on the screen represents an amino acid. And there are 491 of those, and they're all connected together in one, one long chain. So our first step, as Caitlin mentioned, was to make the protein simpler by breaking it down into peptides. And the reason we need to do this is that our mass spectrometer can look at peptides and, as we'll discuss a little bit later, tell us what the amino acid sequence is in the peptides. So the particular enzyme we use to analyze or to digest keratin is called trypsin. And what trypsin does is very specific at where it cleaves proteins, and it always cleaves after lysine, which is re represented by K, or after the arginine, which is rep represented by R. And so if you look on the chain up here on the slide, you can scan down there. You can see the fourth amino acid is a K. So that's an expected cleavage site. If you scan down the chain a little bit farther, you can see R's and K's. And those will be the sites that trypsin will, will cleave. And so I'm going to go to the next slide, and you'll see the cleavage points come in marked by spaces and slashes. And so, as you can see here, you now have a collection of, of peptides. And so we've done two things. We've made the problem simpler by chewing the peptide up into smaller peptides, which we know the mass spectrometer can analyze. But we've also made the problem much more complex. Now, instead of one protein, we now have 45 amino acids that have three or more, uh, or I'm sorry, 45 peptides that have three or more amino acids in them. And so, in uh, hair protein, or I'm sorry, in hair, the number of proteins you have number in the hundreds. And so you can imagine now what you have in your sample that you got from digesting hair is now a mixture of thousands and thousands of peptides. And what you want to do is use the mass spectrometer to measure what the amino acid sequence is in each of those peptides. So this is a really, really hard analytical problem. While we step through this, we're going to focus on a particular peptide in this mix. Um, you see the letters here. And so when the Doherty Valley students come back, we'll look at this particular peptide and how it breaks apart inside the, inside the mass spectrometer. So what I'd like to do is now discuss the instrumentation we use to solve this problem. And so as I said, we have a mixture of a huge number of peptides. And so we separate those peptides, one from the other, using a process called chromatography. And so many of you may have done a very simple paper chromatography experiment in, in a school um, science class. Um, if you did this experiment, you would have taken a strip of paper and put a drop of ink near one end and then dipped the paper in water. And as the water wicked through the paper, it would separate the ink into its component colors. And so, for example, if you put black ink on there, as the components moved across, they may have spread out into bands that were, say, red, yellow, and blue. 
um, across the paper. And so this idea is what we use to separate the peptides one from, from the others, um, but we use it with much more sophisticated kind, kinds of instrumentation. And so the first part of this system um, is the nanoliquid chromatography portion. So instead of putting a drop on a piece of paper, we're actually putting a small amount of our sample into one end of, in, into the instrument. Um, instead of paper, we're using something called a chromatography column. So this column is a long tube and it has inside it particle matter that helps us separate the peptides. And so what happens is this small portion of our sample starts at one end of the column, and then instead of the liquid wicking through the column, would actually uh, pump it through. And what happens is some peptides travel through the column faster than others and some slower. And so the end of this is that the peptides come out of the other end of the column separated from one another in a way that the mass spectrometer can now look at peptides one at a time. The, all of the chemistry and all the separations were done in the liquid phase. Now the mass spectrometer uh, works very, very well on gas phase molecular ions. And so what we have next is the interface between the liquid chromatography system and the mass spectrometer. And this system basically will take the molecules that are dissolved in a liquid, put them into the gas phase, and add an electrical charge to them to make an ion or a charged molecule. So the way our nanospray interface works is we have a very, very fine needle with a high voltage applied to it. And when the liquid comes out of the, the chromatograph, uh, it sprays uh, it's a, a cloud of charged droplets. And these charged droplets go into the mass spectrometer. As they evaporate, they go through a process which then generates these gas phase molecular ions. And so these ions represent peptides, but they now have an electrical charge on them. Now the way to think about the mass spectrometer is it's basically weighing the molecules that go into it. And the way it does this is by measuring mass to charge ratio. And so we can easily determine what the charges are on these molecules by looking at the data. And so in a sense, the mass to charge ratio gives us the unknown mass of the various peptides that come in. And so now just measuring the mass of an intact peptide is not quite enough. And so what we do is a step where we fragment the ions into their smaller parts. And so again, we're kind of following this theme of taking something large like the protein, breaking it down into peptides, and now fragmenting that peptide down so we can understand what the amino acid sequence is in a particular peptide. Once we learn that, we can then build the protein back up and understand where amino acid changes may have occurred and map them back onto the DNA that was the blueprint for making those proteins in the first place. And so inside this mass spectrometer, we undergo a process called fragmentation. And what we do there is take a molecular ion, because it has a charge on it, we can use an electric field to accelerate that ion, and we can collide it with a background gas or a collision gas. And that collision gas will break up the peptides into its, its between the various amino acids. And so I'll go through that in some detail. Um, this is what our data look like, though. And so on the horizontal axis, what we have is mass to charge ratio going from left to right, from low mass up to high mass. And on the vertical axis are uh, the intensity of the various ions that we see. Now, this is a very complex spectrum, but I want to just direct your attention to a particular series that we see in this mass spectrum. And those are the orange peaks that have Y labels on them. And so what I'm going to do in the next slide is basically pull out all of those orange peaks. And so we're just going to focus on those right now. And so what we have here now are a Y series. And we happen to see Y10, Y9, and then on down to Y2. And so what I'd like to do now is show you the peptide that, that gave, rise to, uh, gave rise to this spectrum. And it's this peptide here that has 12 amino acids in it. And so if we take this peptide, we put a charge on it, we accelerate it, collide it with the collision gas, we can start breaking bonds. And it turns out that peptides tend to break at bonds between amino acids. For example, if we break the first bond here between the D and the V, and the D flies away, we're left with a peptide that's one amino acid shorter. Now the nomenclature we use to label these is Y means that we're keeping that uh, the right-hand end of the amino acid and the other one's flying away. 
And the number indicates how many amino acids are left. And so the first one would be Y12 with, with no uh, amino, acid cl amino acids cleaved off. Y11 is the cleavage at the first position. We can also take the same peptide, collide it, and see a second cleavage position now between the second and third amino acid. That would give rise to what we would call Y10. And we can keep following this process. So Y10 is the first one that shows up in our um, mass spectrum. If we break the next bond, we get Y9, which is now the next one down. And you can see we're moving to lower and lower mass. And what's, what you should notice, too, is that the difference between each of these masses corresponds to one amino acid. And so by measuring these spacings between these lines, and therefore the masses, we're actually measuring the mass of each amino acid in that, in that chain. And so we can go continue down. So Y8, you can see which bond breaks for Y8 and leaves this one behind, and we have a peak for that. Similarly for Y7, and then so forth for the rest of the series. And so we have this collection of, of ions, and the main thing to notice is that the difference between pairs of them are a single amino acid. And so we're going to bring the Dougherty Valley High School students back on to basically do a demonstration of this fragmentation process. And in this case, we have an amino acid, or we have an amino acid that's unknown within this peptide. And we're going to show you how, um, using mass spectrometry, we can determine the identity of this particular uh, amino acid. All right. We are back here. So now we represent a peptide fragment, and we are inside a mass spec machine. Okay? Now each student represents an amino acid, and there's this, we have 12 amino acids in a row right here. Now in the mass spec, remember, there are constant collisions going on because we want to fragment the peptide into smaller parts. And so then we can figure out what the unknown amino acid is right here. So let's say we're in the spec, there's collisions going on, and we want to break a bond right here. <laughs> right here, that causes a break. And now we have two fragments, two peptides right here. Now again, we keep doing this over and over again. So let's try this one again. We have this fragment, and instead for this fragment, we're gonna break it right here, <laughs> this one right here. And this, these fragments fall apart, and now we have two fragments. Now the difference is between the fragments, we, we can use those values, the spec um, gives us our values on um, the size, and we can figure out how big this amino acid is. So now our mystery amino acid is, we know it's 121 Daltons, and it's actually a cysteine. So our mutant amino acid is now a cysteine, not a tryptophan. All right, so the mass spec gives us the size of the amino acid and pretty much the sequence of amino acids that we have here. All right, thank you. Back to you, Dean. <laughs> Okay, so we've kind of now gotten down to the point where we know we can determine which peptides have variants in them, and we can use these variants as markers. And so that specifically, um, so we have a, our peptide here, and the normal sequence could have a W in that position, and a variant, because of a mutation in the DNA, could have a C. And so this particular peptide we can use as a marker for identification. And so if we look at a person, we can ask whether that person has the variant peptide or not in their, in their hair proteins. Now, the way we use this for identification is we need many, many markers, right? And so what we do is we look at different peptides and locate which peptides have these variants that represent mutations in a person's DNA. And so to, to maybe illustrate this, you can imagine if we had five markers that we knew were in a particular population. And so if we took a particular individual, and that individual had marker one, three, and five, well, that is characteristic of that individual. And so if we had another hair from somebody else, and they had, say, only markers two and four, we could say with high confidence that these proteins came from different people because the markers did not match. We could also imagine another sample coming in that also had one, three, and five in that. And the question arises, is that just a random match in the population, or is that coming from that individual? And so that brings up the question, these markers are useful, but how many of these markers do you need to uniquely identify a person? And so Brad talked a little bit about this in the context of STRs and DNA. And so we really have 
a very similar kind of thought process. We need enough markers so that by identifying a collection of those markers, we can say with confidence that a person, say, for example, um, the chances of this being randomly matched in the world, which has a population of 7 billion, is there's just one chance of having that random, random match. So the way we do this is we calculate something called the power of discrimination. And this relies on a tool that we use in probability called the product rule. And the idea there is if you have a probability of one event happening and a probability of another independent event happening, the chances of them both happening at the same time is the product of those two. And I'll just run through a simple example um, to illustrate this and then go to a more complex example where we actually did the, the full calculation on the number of markers you need. But just to get the, the concept, imagine that we have some population. We'll say it's a population of the world. And let's say we have found a marker. And to keep the math simple, we'll say, let's say this marker appears in half of the population. Okay? And so if we have just one marker and we see it in a person, well, we would know that half of the world's population has that marker. And so it's not really discriminating very effectively, right? The chances of that marker being randomly matched in the population is one half. And let's say we have two markers, and the second marker also appears at one half in the population. Well, now if we consider the half of the population that had the first marker, well, half of those will have the second marker, and so a quarter of the population will have both markers. Now, if we add a third marker, again, we just can continue the process. So we know that the green part here, a quarter of the population, has two markers, and if half of those have the third, well, then one-eighth of the population has all three. And so you can keep building up numbers of markers. And so if they all had, for example, one half frequency, once you get up to 10, you'd have about one in 1,000. Once you get up to 20, you'd have about one in a million. Now, the markers that we find in proteins don't all have a frequency of one half. And so it's a more complicated problem. But we can basically use the same idea of the product rule and go through real frequencies of real markers and ask that question, how many do you need to get a random match probability of one in the population of the world? And the results of our calculation are shown here, where the number of markers required are shown on the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis shows the power of, dis power of discrimination. And so our calculated line is the blue. And so what we can do is use this, this graph to answer some of these questions. For example, if we want a random match probability of 1 in 7 billion, which is the population of the Earth, we start at that top arrow. We follow that green line along over to the blue line, down to the bottom. And we see we need roughly 100 markers in a panel to identify a person with a random match probability of 1 in the population of the Earth. And so 100 markers is very easy for the chromatography and mass spec technology that we have. I already showed you that we can sift through thousands upon thousands of peptides. And so a panel of 100 is very easy. Um, you might also ask, well, you know, the population of the Earth is big. What about uniqueness in the population of the US? We have also have those numbers as well. And so the population of the Earth is, I'm sorry, the US is around 300 million. So if we use this chart, we can see around 80 markers are need, needed for random match probability of one in the population of the, of, the, of the country. Right now, where we are in terms of number of markers is right around 60 markers that we've discovered. And that uh, collection gives us about one in, a million, one in a million power of discrimination. So if you start at 60 on the bottom and follow the red line up and over to the line, you get to t 10 to the six, or, or about one in a million. And so, our research right now is really doing a few things. One is discovering more of these markers. Um, we also need to understand how stable they are. We also need to understand what their frequencies are in various populations um, in, the, in the world so we can do the statistics properly. So the final thing I wanted to talk about is that we've really focused on hair proteins. And hair are very, is very important in forensics, but there are a lot of other tissues that are important in forensics. Um, that we've studied. And we've studied tooth and bone, and we're starting to study skin cells as well. And all these materials have significant quantities of proteins present. And so for the case of tooth and bone, um, these, you can imagine, are useful in forensics, right? Because if you find um, unknown remains somewhere, usually they're skeletal in nature, and so there are bones and teeth involved. 
Um, oftentimes there is DNA, so you can make an identification, but there may be cases where there isn't DNA or the DNA has been compromised in some way. And so this is where using the protein tools that we're developing will, will, will be useful. In the case of bones, um, we're really paralleling what we've done in the hair studies. Um, bones are primarily made, the proteins there are primarily collagens, and so we're looking at these markers in collagen proteins using much of the same techniques. Tooth also have a number of proteins that are interested and can be used for identification, but they also have a set that I wanted to mention um, called amylogenin. And this is the protein in your tooth that's responsible for building up the enamel layers. And it appears at the junction between the dentin in your teeth and the enamel. And what's interesting about this protein is that the genes for it reside on the X and Y chromosomes. And so these are so-called sex chromosomes. And so we can use the identification of which protein came from the X chromosome and which came from the Y and determine from a tooth whether the remains came from a male or female. And so with our, we're expanding in, not just from identification but also into sex determination. So finally, on my last slide, I'd just like to wrap up with kind of the applications that um, these protein-based techniques can be used for. Um, we spend a lot of the time talking about associating people with crimes, right? And so if there's a person who's been at a crime scene, they can leave material behind, right? They can leave hair or they can leave skin cells behind that we can analyze. If they handle an object, also they can leave hair on that object and skin cells behind as well, and we can use that evidence. And as was mentioned earlier in the talk, it's very important for us not only to be able to include somebody in a suspect list, but also have the information to exclude. So we can show you know, with some confidence that somebody was present, but we can also show with confidence if the markers absolutely don't match, that person was not there. And so we can show both, you know, indicate both guilt and, and innocence as well. I talked a little bit about unidentified remains you know, that involve missing persons or mass casualties. Um, these also have, you know, as I mentioned, protein evidence that can be used. What's also very interesting, if you think about archaeology, it really is forensics done on uh, sites that are ancient in nature. But you're asking a lot of the same questions that you are in forensics. You know, who, are, who was here? What were they doing? Um, in many cases, archaeological samples are so old that the DNA may not be present and it may have degraded, but many times there is protein available. And so we can use proteins, um, and in this case, really exploit the link back to DNA, understand uh, things about uh, migration patterns, contacts between different groups, and also when you're trying to understand kind of the social structures of ancient cultures, determining the sex of various skeletons that you find really plays a big, a big role in that. And so with that, I'll close, and thank you very much.